Hello everybody and welcome back. The last time we left off, Liz and Sylvia were in this small cult temple trailing after two rather determined members of the Veiled Society. And this is their mission. Originally it was for 20 gold pieces, but the stakes have been raised because we believe this is the only way we can get Malin back from, well, whatever adventure he's been on. So let's continue from where we left off. This room has four cultists. They're tougher, higher level, more damage and better armor class. And they have cure light wounds spells amongst them. Two of them are clerics and two of them are fighters. Let's roll for surprise. They may have heard that fight going on down here and we have made no attempt to be subtle in rushing forward. There is no surprise. So they jump up, face us. Oops. Round one. We get initiative and it's missiles first. Liz. Who misses. I'm going to do spells next. I'm going to do Sylvia with a magic missile. And that's max damage. She takes seven off one from 16 to 9. Bob just charges in and misses. And Jane fumbles badly. There go. Two on Bob. That hits him for four damage. He's down to 12. Second one hits him for another three damage. He's down to nine. One on Jane misses. And that one misses. Okay, round two. We get initiative. Liz shoots again. Misses. Sylvia's gonna try that second magic missile and does another six damage. One is down to three. Bob, he hits AC four, he does six damage. One is down to 10. Jane misses. Okay. There I go. A miss. A miss. And that's a hit on Jane. She's down to 1 HP. And that is a miss on Jane. So it's round to 3. We get initiative. Liz. Hits and does 2 damage. 1 is down to 14. Sylvia. Hits and kills one. Jane drinks her healing potion. She's up to six HP. And Bob. Hits and does six damage. Cultist on him is down to four. There go. Oops, sorry. One on Bob. Misses two on Jane, it's a miss, and that is a hit. She's down to five. Round four, we get initiative again. Liz hits, and her cultist is down to nine. Sylvia. Misses. Bob. Misses. Jane. Hits and takes three off that one. It's under 13. There go. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Right, wow, that one takes six points off Bob. He's done three HP. Two on Jane, 
that one fumbles badly. And the second one takes three points off her. She's down to two. Right. Round five. We get initiative again. That's five initiatives in a row. Liz misses. Sylvia misses. Bob is going to drink a healing potion. He's up to six HP. Jane is out of everything. And she misses. Okay, it's their go. One on Bob. Misses. One on Jane. Misses. Second one. Misses. She's escaped with the skin of her teeth. Round six. We get initiative again. Right, Liz. Misses. Sylvia misses badly. Bob misses. Jane misses. There go. I'm sorry. Keep doing that. That one hits Bob for four damage. He's down to two. That one hits Jane and kills her. So that's one member of the Veiled Society dead. And the last one goes for Sylvia. And hits AC3 and hits takes a point off Sylvia. She's down to 13. Okay, so it's round 6. No, it's round 7. And it's mutual. I'll do them first. One on Bob misses. Second one on Bob hits AC3, does five damage, kills him. The one on Sylvia hits again and does five points off her. She's down to eight. Our go. Liz hits plus one range and kills one. There's two cultists left. Sylvia guzzles a healing potion. Nice one, she's back up to 14. Right, round eight. There's two cultists versus us two. They get initiative. One on Liz. Hits and takes two points off her. One on Sylvia. Misses. Our round is to switch to melee, so it's round nine. And they get initiative. That's a miss on Sylvia. And that's a miss on Liz. Right, both of Sylvia and Liz have short swords plus two. So Liz's thaco is 15, and Sylvia's is 17. Liz hits and does three damage. One cultist is down to ten. Sylvia misses. Okay, this is round ten. And we get initiative. Liz misses. Sylvia misses. Cultist hits Liz for two. Sorry, three. She's down to 14. That one misses Sylvia. Okay, round 11. And they get initiative. They've had four initiatives in a row. That's a hit on Liz. She's down to 11. And that is a hit on Sylvia. She's down to eight. Liz hits. And this one's down to six HP. Sylvia. No, she misses. 
Right. Round 12. We get initiative. Liz hits the one on hers down to three. Sylvia misses. Gonna do a morale check for these two. They fight on. And that is a hit on Liz for another five points. She's down to six. And that's a miss on Sylvia. Round 13. They get initiative. That's a miss on Liz. That's a miss on Sylvia. Liz drinks her potion. Nice one is up to 12. Sylvia strikes her cultist. And misses. Round 14. We get initiative. Oh my god. That's a miss from Liz. And that is a hit from Sylvia. And she does three damage. Cultist on her is dead. There's one left. And it fights on. And it misses. Right, round 14. It gets initiative. It misses. Liz hits AC4. That's enough. And that is down to 2 HP. Sylvia misses <laughs> round 15. We get initiative. Liz misses. Sylvia hits and kills the final cultist. Wow. And our team are not in a good way. Right. There are four dead cultists and we've got two dead members of the Veiled Society. Now we look at this altar here. Liz is going to search it for traps. And she doesn't find any traps. But on this altar is a small artifact. It looks like a small effigy or an idol. While we assume that's what the Veiled Society want. What they want with it, who knows. But they clearly have no good intentions for it. So Liz takes it and puts it in her satchel. And this, they believe, is what is wanted in exchange for Malin. So they go back outside. Back into the sewerage system. Back up into this little alleyway. And round the corner. And there, waiting for them, is their contact from the Veiled Society. They give him the little idol. He asks what happened to Bob and Jane. Sylvia just says, they're dead. The man just shrugs, like it's of no consequence. But he thanks them profusely for the idol. And says, if only you were on the right team. But anyway, we'll keep our word. When you get back to your inn, you'll find your reward waiting for you. Well, fingers crossed that reward is Malin. So they go back to the inn. When Liz and Sylvia get back to their room at the Splinter Diamond, they find a body on their floor. They recognise his clothes and his build. It's Malin. He's trussed up with ropes and there's a sack over his head. They set to work and untie him. He sits on the floor looking profoundly miserable. He has nothing to say. In fact, he seems lost in his thoughts. We need to get him to bed, says Sylvia. He'll have to stay here with you. I'll sleep at the Duke's League. Can you fetch Roman Blackthorn? asks Liz. He might help us. Something doesn't seem right. So Sylvia fetches the guys from there in. They gather on the landing outside Liz's bedroom door. Oh, I'm going to make some predictions, says Rowan. First, is that he has seen himself as the most powerful wizard in the world. He probably had a castle or a tower made of crystal or some such nonsense. Second, he believes it to be possible, and he is certain he knows how to make it possible. And third, here the halfling sighs heavily, he'll want more black cap to find out more about its future. Oh dear, oh dear. They go into the bedroom. Malin is sitting up in bed, looking wretched. What happened after we ran from the riot? asks Donard. 
I got lost, said Malin, and the others will have to accept that answer. And then I found a corner, and I smoked some of those mushrooms. It would have smelt enough to attract attention, says Rowan. The wrong kind of attention. Malin nods. Two guys came by. They stopped and approached me. They told me there's a place to do that in comfort, and where I couldn't get more. They led me to a house. I remember them laughing. They seemed really friendly. Can you remember this house? Asks Liz. Malin shakes his head. By the time I got there, I was losing touch with the reality. I could probably remember the alleyway, and even the street where I was taken. Well, that's a start, says Rowan, but we need to look after you. What did you see when you left reality behind? Malin's face screws up almost on the verge of tears. I saw myself as a powerful warlock. All magic was mine to command. I know that sounds daft, but it really isn't. And why isn't it daft? Rowan quizzes. Because I knew exactly what I had to do to make it happen. I knew all the steps, the tasks, the rituals. He looks around at the others. I knew it all. And do you mind telling us, says Rowan sceptically, what these steps are? Malin slumps. I can't remember. But if I go back there, I could remember what they are. And therein, says Rowan, lies the danger. And what's to stop you from forgetting all of this a second time as well? I'd write notes, says Malin with certainty. I'd write it all down. Have you ever seen these so-called notes written by people on Black Cat? I have, says Rowan. Are they gibberish? asks Carrick. They aren't even language, says Rowan sharply. Imagine getting a child to draw a page full of spiders without ever having seen a spider. But what's worse is that some of these scrawlings contain images that only the maker can make sense of, and whatever is in them can drive a person mad. And I mean mad. Gibbering fools, wandering the lanes and byways, muttering to themselves. Relatives locked up in the attic. Do you want that to happen to you, Sonny? But why would that happen? says Malin, but I saw everything clearly, and it didn't make me mad. What you saw, son, was the fantasy that covers the evil underneath. Your hand makes these notes, and to see the fantasy, it ends up drawing the evil in its raw form. Rowan starts pacing around the room. People think of evil in terms of creatures, orcs, goblins, or the undead, vampires and such, or demons from the hells. But there's a whole world of evil in the plants and flora of the world. It's a sentient, living evil that grows slowly, biding its time. These mushrooms are evil, have nothing to do with them. Liz gasps. Will he be harmed? Not yet, says Rowan. He's not yet addicted. But see how easy it is to want more and more? You must realise, son, you were tricked, lied to by a genuine evil. The room falls silent. Eventually the halfling speaks. You'd best stay in bed and your sister should watch over you. I haven't yet forgiven you for stealing from me, but you can make amends. That street you were taken to, that's the closest lead I have to finding who trades in this evil. So, you'll be taking me there when you're ready. Right, it's the next morning and Liz and Malin won't be at the funeral. That's her, a chance to mix with high society blown, even if it wasn't the nicest of occasions. So the funeral is held in this area here, and our party have very much got a back row. They're standing well away from the graveside, under some trees, alongside a chief of the guards, who's also an honorary guest. And Malin and the chief are able to point out who's who, and they point out a rather thin man who's in his 60s and his name's Anton Radu. He's the head of the Radu family and there are two couples beside him who are younger coming into middle age and they're his sons, Zweis and Antonio, with their wives. And they have between them three grandsons, Theodosius, Emil and Pietra. And Emil does not look well, and Rowan goes, mm hmm. That, my friends, is what happens when you take black cap. That's what you look like. Well, it's no surprise that some of the wealthiest people in the town are drug addicts. They also point out a young man, and that's Alexander Tornescu, and despite his youth, he is the head of the Tornescu family. His father, Christoph, died recently, and he is surrounded largely by cousins. And Sylvia recognises Stefanos, who they met at the Adventurers and Explorers Club. 
Last of all is Baron Vorloy, who's the head of the Vorloy family. His daughter, Mariana, is there. And a rather foolish-looking young man called Grigori, that's his son. And his sister has turned up with her husband. And they are the parents of Lucia. And they only made it into the city this morning. And of course, it is, as you could expect, not a very happy day. Some of the families break off for a private word and they come within earshot of our party. God, that's so convenient. Anton Radu shakes hands with Baron Vorloy, looking grim. Baron Vorloy takes the hand with a certain trepidation. And Anton Radu says, Our families have differences. Baron Vorloy snorts and says, Big differences. But Radu ignores that and just continues, But the death of the young generation is always a tragedy. Baron Vorloy looks at him coldly and says, Your greedy claws are somewhere about this. And he warns, I'll get to the bottom of this. Anton Radu waves in the direction of the Tarnescu family and says, My family don't deal in murder. Try threatening those ones. And the Baron retorts with, I'll bankrupt you and your family. I'll get justice. Anton Radu just looks down his nose at him and says, not if I ruin you first. So, money can't buy you happiness, obviously, because things seem to be no happier for those people with money. So that's the end of the funeral. Everyone drifts off. Our party aren't invited to the wake, and indeed, they had a very small presence there. Right, back at the Splinter Diamond, Liz obviously wants to know all about the funeral and life on the hill with the nobility. Malin is looking much, much better and he owes Rowan a favour. So instead of going to a high society funeral, Liz ends up in the slums, the nest, with her brother and Rowan as they try and trace where Malin can last remember he was when he started smoking the black cap and then where he was taken. And he can sort of vaguely remember these streets. But when he gets to about here, he kind of thinks, I can't remember any further. It was definitely the street, but I don't know where it might have been. Rowan says to Liz, do you recognise this street? Liz shakes her head. She doesn't recognise it. Rowan takes him down a little other street and says, do you recognise this street? And she says, oh yes, this is where the brothel was, wasn't it? And Rowan nods and he says, now what's the odds that the brothel and the house your brother was taken to are back to back and there's a doorway between the two? Hmm. And so they go to the guardhouse in the nest and speak to Captain Montano and tell her what they think. She says she'll get onto it with some men. And well, there's nothing really to do. And so they go back to the inn. They hang around for the day, resting mostly. It's not been much of a holiday in the city, has it? And eventually one of the constabulary from the nest does come to the inn and up in their room he has some news for them. And the news is that sure enough the brothel did back on to another house and there was a secret door between the two of them. They found the secret door, burst it open and they did indeed find a den of drug users. Somehow the madam of the brothel must have tipped people off because there were no staff there. There was just people drugged out of their heads and they had nothing to say. And the officer has a couple of things to give to Rowan. One is a large bag of black cat mushrooms, which they managed to find on the raid. Well, that is a huge blow, because that is worth an absolute fortune. Malin takes one look at this bag with horror and says, get that away from me, which is kind of a good sign that he is not addicted to this stuff. Rowan had a quiet word with the captain to search Ruby's room in the brothel for that extra treasure that the other girls thought that she had and they couldn't find. And the officers did a thorough raid of Ruby's room and sure enough, they have something to hand to Rowan. They give him a golden locket with jewels in it on a gold chain and on the back of the locket is engraved the initials from ST to LV. Everybody sees that and immediately says, from Simeon Tornescu to Lucia Vorloy. Now what was that locket doing in the room of a courtesan in the nest? Well, it's coming on to early evening. And there's a hell of a lot to think about. But after all that good work, they're going to go back to the Golden Book. 
here in Bricktop for another really nice dinner. It's time to get dressed up. It's time to put all the business of the past few days behind them and, well, try and enjoy something. And as they walk to the Golden Book and as they have their dinner, they talk over all the theories as to why this locket, which clearly must belong to Lucia Vorloi from ST, ended up in Ruby's possessions. And theories are that it was stolen off Lucia's body when she was being killed. Well, that's plausible. But then Rowan asks, now why on earth would some criminal give some low-life prostitute this really expensive necklace? Even if she was his girlfriend, he would have sold this for an absolute fortune and bought her something cheap as a gift. And then maybe Ruby was there at the murder and she stole it. And again, that doesn't seem plausible because who goes to a house to murder somebody and they bring their girlfriend along? What about the fact that Simeon Tarnescu was seen talking to Ruby? Well, he might have stolen it off Lucia's body as she was murdered in some sort of fit of, well, revenge. If he gave her the locket, then he took it off her when he killed her. And then somehow it got into the hands of Ruby. It's unlikely Simeon would have just given it to her. Can you explain that? Well, perhaps when Simeon and Ruby were together and he didn't have his clothes on, she stole it from his pockets. Which means essentially that he went and murdered Lucia Vorloi, took her locket, then went to see Ruby. Then, while they were in bed together, she stole the locket off him. He then found out and murdered her in the alleyways. That's rather a convoluted plot, but it's the only one that makes sense. Sylvia suggests that maybe Lucia never got it. It was when Simeon proposed to her at the docks. This was a gift that he gave her, and when she brushed him off, he just kept it. But one look at the locket can tell that it's several years old and is actually quite well worn, which makes everyone think it was also well loved by Lucia. So there's a lot to think about. Again, things aren't looking good for Simeon Tarnescu because for some reason the locket of his murdered wannabe fiance has ended up in the room of a courtesan that he was seen talking to and she was murdered. So that seems to be the end of the evening and the end of the meal and they come out of here and you've got to remember that this is a very steep hill. There are several hills in Specularum. This is the largest and the steepest. There's another one here and another one here. So they're quite high up and they have a good view over the city as they leave and they can see an orange glow from here. It's a bit too late for a sunset. So they climb up the hill a bit further to the foot of the castle and they can see all the way down this street over the rooftops to the docks. Everything here, this big massive construction site, all the wood, all the gantries, all the scaffolding, all the pitch, all the tar, all the resins is on fire. This place is an inferno and this massive construction site is burning to the ground. Well, well, well. And that is clearly the work of the Radu family against the Vorloi family. And so, says Rowan, what do you make of that? And then he takes out the locket and he looks at it, the furrowed brow. And then he looks over at the fire in the docks and he says, I think it's about time we wrapped this up. I think we have all we need to do it. And well, perhaps next time we'll wrap up this mystery. So I'll see you then.